Next up, we have Krista Hutoff Lee from Children's Hospital in Colorado. Um, and the topic is how to cope with grief, anxiety, and loss, how to talk to others about my diagnosis. Thank you, Krista, for, for being here. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and to speak with everyone today. I'm sorry that I also couldn't be there in person, um, but I'm really thankful for this hybrid opportunity. It looks like we have a lot of people joining us from really all over the world, which is just so amazing. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Harder for inviting me um, and recommending that I was able to be able to present um, today. So thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, just kind of the first steps after your initial diagnosis. So how do we cope with kind of that roller coaster of emotions that you'll experience um, after the diagnosis? and then how to talk with other people about the diagnosis. And so my approach to this presentation has been just some really broad-based ideas to kind of help orient you. Um, everyone is on their own individual journey, and some of these things may resonate with some people and not apply to others. So kind of recognizing that, um, but wanting to give you guys some ideas. Um, and then if we have some time, um, talk a little bit about some ways to kind of start your thinking about your own individual journey on this. Um, Krista? Can we, yes. can, can we ask you to please go full screen with your PowerPoint presentation? It looks a little small on our end. Um, yes, thank you. How about yeah, that? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. This looks great. Thanks. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right, so my first thing is I just don't have any financial disclosure disclosures. I'll talk a little bit about my background. Um, I did undergraduate training at the University of Denver and participated in a lot of different types of research with um, children at that time and then did some graduate training at the University of Northern Colorado. Um, I'm formally trained as a school psychologist, so I know a lot about the different types of interventions that um, many kiddos can get within the school setting. And then I um, completed a neuropsychological internship at the Children's Hospital in Colorado, followed by a neuropsychology fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital Baylor College of Medicine. Um, much like Dr. Harder, I work in a neuroimmunology clinic for children, um, a multidisciplinary clinic for children with a variety of different demyelinating and autoimmune diseases. Um, it was established in 2015, um, and as a part of that work, we also have kind of monthly um, evaluations where we complete targeted evaluations for children um, who come into our clinic. Um, they also get an opportunity to meet with a psychologist, neurologist, social worker, really to provide this wraparound support. Um, and then we are involved in research and educational opportunities as well. Um, so today, what I want to spend some time is just talking in the initial steps after your diagnosis, kind of things that can kind of help orient you along the path. Um, some ideas of how you can talk with others, and then some thoughts about how to manage some of the emotions that you may experience on this journey. So the first kind of step that we'll talk about is just gathering information. Um, so oftentimes, you know, talking with your medical team is the first recommendation that we have. Many of them have um, good resources out there. So Dr. Google has lots of great ideas, but can sometimes lead us down a spiraling um, case that we don't want to be on. And so really asking your medical team and being able to connect you with good resources. Um, some ideas that can kind of help make the most out of your appointment would be to write down some questions before your appointment. Um, there, and we've all kind of experienced that white coat syndrome when you go into a session and um, the physician is talking very quickly and um, you might not remember the questions that you had had um, prior to the appointment. A lot of um, individuals benefit from starting what's called a healthcare journal. So kind of being able to kind of monitor your symptoms or kind of how you're feeling on different days. Um, and this can really help provide valuable information to your medical team, but can also help you start tracking for patterns and um, potential triggers that could be helping you feel worse or having symptom recurrence and things like that. Um, bring someone with you to appointments. It's really helpful to have kind of a um, person who can listen in and be able to kind of review what you heard and kind of um, provide additional information that you might have missed um, during the session. And then again, that idea of asking for reliable resources for medical team, kind of who would be um, a good resource or what kind of community um, ac advocacy groups are out there that might be available to provide you with some support. 
And being mindful of online resources, there are so much, there's just so much information out there, um, but we wanna make sure that it's giving you the right information and that you're not unfortunately um, experiencing misinformation or things like that that might lead you down a path that would not be as helpful for you. Um, so this idea of processing emotional response is really important, you know, um, whenever you hear information about your health or potentially bad information, there's going to be a roller coaster of emotions and kind of giving yourself um, permission to, to feel all of those emotions and to not feel guilty about them, I think is really important. Um, and I think it's very normal to feel angry or scared or anxious about all of these things and giving yourself some space to feel those is very valuable. Um, but it's also important in this moment to kind of seek emotional support, and that may be from families or friends um, or potentially from professional support. So, you know, there's a number of support groups or even individual therapy um, that might be helpful um, to um, get some support during these difficult times. We talk a lot about developing a support network. Um, so we often just talked about this emotional support. So from families or friends or from other people, right? The st we're stronger together kind of idea of kind of reaching out to other people who have a same or a similar diagnosis and kind of hearing about their journey and what helped them um, can be really valuable in this stage. Um, Oftentimes we talk about what physical support. So this idea of during this kind of, um, you know, really stressful time, can you have some assistance with house chores or with transportation or meal prep? Are there people that you trust in your circle that you can reach out to who might be able to lighten your load a little bit so that it gives you a little bit more time to, um, to recharge and to strengthen yourself during these times? There's also a number of formal accommodations that you can talk about with. So um, you know, the Department of Vocational Rehab can be one resource for individuals who might need to um, or might want to apply for accommodations within the workplace. Um, there's also a number of school-based accommodations or interventions that are available for um, children and adolescents who might need support within the school environment. So one of those is a 504 plan that can provide academic accommodations so things like preferential seating or being able to have some extended time or rest breaks, things like that, that we can use to address some of the fatigue or lingering symptoms that children might experience as they reenter the school system. Um, some kiddos benefit from more significant academic interventions. So um, schools can offer what are called individualized education programs or IEPs where children are offered um, additional academic instruction or sometimes therapies like physical, occupational, or speech language therapies and be able to um, have some additional support that way throughout the school to help them be more successful. Um, many schools are also offering what's called a, a multi-tiered system of supports or MTSS program or what used to be called response to intervention or RTI. Um, these are more um, academic interventions within the general education classroom and so kind of ways to kind of help support reading or writing or math development within the general education education classroom and can also be beneficial for some students. Um, Dr. Harder talked a little bit about healthy habits, and so we know things like diet and exercise and good sleep can also help support um, your mood during this time. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but really determining your values and meaning in this time. So what brings you joy? What activities do you find rewarding? And kind of using those to strengthen yourself during um, this time. There's the idea of setting realistic goals. So how much can you realistically complete in a day and what can you say no to? Um, so some of you may have heard about the spoon theory. Um, by Christine um, Mezzarindino, and she talks about kind of every day you're allotted a certain number of spoons, and each activity that you engage in might use up one of those spoons. And so being able to really think about how much energy you might have in a day and how you want to spend that time and that energy that you have and prioritizing kind of the things that are important to you. And so you may be a person where family is very important to you or your career is very important to you or the volunteer work that you do is very important and kind of being mindful of not over committing um, and being able to say no or at least not right now um, to be able to give you an opportunity to, to focus on the things that are really important to you.
Um, there's this idea of focusing on your abilities. So it's very easy to kind of get into a mind frame where you focus on what um, you can't do, what looks different from before. And so there's this idea of really reframing that and saying, what can I do now that's similar to what I was doing before? So maybe it's not exactly the same. Um, so there's the idea of, okay, maybe you can't play, play like a full round of golf, but maybe you could do the nine holes, or maybe you could ride in the golf cart and still play them. So what can you do that still allows you to engage in the activities that you enjoy, um, but isn't as physically demanding or as um, fatiguing as it might have been before. So really thinking about how do I modify an activity to be able to still participate in it. And so work may be really important to you. And so how do you modify, you know, your work schedule or your work demands? Or are there ways that you can kind of spread out the really intense work activities across the course of the week so that they're not all bunched into one day and being able to kind of, again, spread out those spoons that you might have in that situation? We also talk about developing coping strategies. So physical kind of coping strategies could be something like yoga or meditation or taking walks. There can be, you know, more cognitive or um, cognitive um, coping strategies where you're thinking of, um, you know, word puzzles or um, journaling or things like that. And then mental where you're thinking um, more of really being able to participate in um, therapeutic interventions where you're, you know, working on developing a toolbox of coping strategies for when things are more challenging. So maybe you're practicing, um, you know, progressive muscle relaxation or deep breathing, you know, some of those activities that might be able to support you um, during the times that are more challenging. So I'm gonna transition just now to talking about how to share information about your medical diagnosis. Um, and I think we all live in these different systems um, where we have our kind of individual kind of families and our homes and our interpersonal relationships with our romantic partners or our spouses. And then we also function within a number of different communities. So we have our school or our workplace, our neighborhood, the community that we live in, the government that we're a part of, um, and how all of those things affect um, us on, on an individual level and, and may affect how you want to share information about your medical diagnosis. Um, so I've broken it down into this idea of sharing information. And so I think it's really important to kind of think about who do you want to share this information with. So um, thinking about your family, so your immediate family, um, your extended family, who are the people that you trust and, and, and really want to want to know this information? Um, and I think, you know, the, it's really important to consider that you're not obligated to tell anyone, right? Like this is your information. And I think it's really important that you feel comfortable and that you trust the people that you tell. Um, there's friends that you may feel comfortable sharing this information with, and there's kind of friends that you may not want to share that with. Um, in terms of school, workplace, and community-based activities, I think, you know, some of the information about what and when to share with those um, individuals in those systems may be um, related to what kind of services you're hoping to um, receive. So if um, you have a child where you would really like a 504 plan um, for them to kind of help with addressing some of the fatigue or potential cognitive vulnerabilities that um, he or she may present with, you may need to share that medical diagnosis to be able to ensure that the child is eligible. Um, for those services. And, you know, so the same thing with the workplace. There may be some people that need to know the diagnosis and some people who do not. And so being mindful of um, kind of who you're telling and, and being very clear about where you would like that information to be shared and with whom in the environment. Um, and then the same with community-based activities. Again, if you're applying for um, different resources within the community, you may need or want to share that diagnosis with the people. Another idea is why. So again, kind of really setting the stage of like, is it necessary to tell people in that environment? Um, and do I want to tell this person? And then is this person that you're going to tell someone that you can trust? Um, and I think that's a really important factor for people to be mindful of, um, you know, and being very clear about the expectations that, you know, I'm going to tell you this, it's very important to me, but I would appreciate it if you didn't share it with other people or if you could keep this to yourself so that that 
individual understands kind of where you want that information to travel. Or you may be a person who really would like that person to kind of share your story with others so that you don't have to keep repeating the story. And I think being, um, um, being clear about that can really help support you as well. So what is important to share when you decide you feel comfortable sharing information? Um, the name of the diagnosis, um, the symptoms that you experience. And so it could be something like what that looks like for you now, what it could look like in the future, um, and what triggers you might have for um, relapses or recurrences and things like that. And then oftentimes people upon hearing these diagnoses or these concerns will want to know what they can do to help. Um, and so being thoughtful about like, is there, you know, identified behavior that might be helpful? Gosh, it'd be great if you could bring dinner on the first Thursday of the month, or it'd be amazing if you could help take my kiddos to school on this day or something like that. And, and giving them some type of action that can feel like they're doing things. Um, recognizing that that can be hard to come up with we're in the, when we're in the middle of a storm and so kind of giving yourself some grace if you're not able to do that as well. Um, so sharing information, when and how. So I think the timing of disclosing a diagnosis can be really important. Um, it may not be something that you do in the carpool lane, or it might not be something that you do at the big holiday event, um, that maybe you really find time to kind of meet individually with a person and kind of talk about what's happening. Um, location can be an important thing to consider. So is this someone you want to tell in person? Is this someone that you have to or need to tell over the phone? Um, kind of how are you going to kind of set the stage for this to feel like a conversation where you were heard and, and um, have information shared with the person that you would like to? And then the amount of information to share. Um, so you don't need to tell everyone everything. So, you know, are there certain people that you need to just tell the basics to um, versus like a best friend or a romantic partner or spouse where you really want to tell more of the elaborate details, kind of understanding um, that you are able to kind of differentiate between different individuals in your life and what you're willing or wanting to share with them. So this is the other big piece is managing the responses. Um, so when you tell people, you may find that you get a lot of unwelcome opinions or recommendations that um, others are wanting to share. So, oh, if you'd only do this, or I heard about so-and-so who used this kind of medication or this vitamin and it cured everything. And if you just do that, everything would be better. Um, or the negative comments. Well, you don't look sick. You don't look like there's anything wrong. And some of those kind of really negative comments that can affect you um, when you're deciding to share information. Or the overly positive responses, right? The everything's fine. You'll do great. It's not a big deal. At least it's not X, right? So some of those things that can be um, really challenging. And I think at the end of the day, it can be really hard to tell other people um, about your diagnosis because you might be concerned about these types of outcomes that you might receive. Um, and I think there have been studies that have shown a benefit of individuals who receive social support and kind of are able to kind of actively plan their response to their diagnosis and treatment. And those individuals two years post kind of a medical diagnosis are much um, more well adjusted and, and report higher levels of quality of life. So even though I think this process can be really challenging and um, can potentially raise some very uncomfortable conversations, there is some research to support the fact that this process can be really helpful in supporting your long-term overall well-being. So I know I have just a few more minutes and I wanted to spend a little bit of time kind of dipping down into this idea of how do we manage some of our long-term emotions. Um, and again, this I think is, is something that is an ongoing journey and so not something that I'll be able to completely help with in 30 minutes, um, but kind of gives you some ideas and some um, kind of initial steps to start thinking about how can I manage this in the long run. 
Um, so the first is to identify some of our triggers for anxiety and for low mood. So again, starting with that healthcare journal, you can start to track when, you know, what are the days that I was feeling better and, and what was happening on those days? You know, did I use up all my spoons before noon and thus was feeling really fatigued and tired? Or did I have extra supports that day? Um, and really looking at what you can do to kind of identify what is making um, a good day good and a bad day not so great. Be mindful of those downward spirals that we can all um, be vulnerable to. So, you know, the kind of cascading effect of like, oh, I had a bad day. It means I'm going to have a bad week. It means I'm going to have a bad year and trying to really be um, thoughtful and challenging those negative thoughts. Like that was a bad day. I wish it hadn't happened, but tomorrow will be a better day and trying to kind of stop that kind of negative um, cognition that we can all engage in when we're having bad days. Working towards creating what are called upward spirals. So what are the things that make you happy and can we do more of those? Um, so this really gets into a type of therapy called behavioral activation. Um, and we'll talk about some of the main themes in that type of therapy. But the idea behind it is really to um, identify um, kind of some things that can make you feel better. So we're going to actively start monitoring, tracking your mood, looking at the activities that make you happy and the activities that bring you down or make you sad. And then identify your personal values and um, identify associated activities with them. So are you someone who um, really values time with family or someone who really values his or her career? And how can we kind of directly um, engage in activities that are going to help you to start feeling, um, feel successful in those activities again? Um, so when we talk about some of these, there's, you know, a couple of different areas that we look at for your values. So the first one is physical well-being. And so we talk about, are you someone who, you know, views yourself as, um, really valuing what you look like or how active you are. And if that's the case, like how do we help you re-engage in some of those physical activities that you may have enjoyed doing before? Again, recognizing that some of them might need to be modified, but really helping being able to get you back into that those physical activities that you value. Another one would be kind of, are you someone who really values mental and emotional well-being? And so if that's the case, you know, what activities can you do that help support that? So are you someone who's really values meditation or yoga? Or can you, um, you know, spend some time with a therapist or a coach who might be able to help you um, manage some of the emotions and develop some of those coping strategies to help get you through this storm? Family relationships. So gosh, I really love um, bedtime reading with my kids. So how do I make sure I have enough spoons left at the end of the day that I can be um, a part of the bedtime routine um, and um, kind of maybe um, you know, your romantic relationship is really important. How do I carve out time for a date night once a month? Or um, how do we make sure that we have good communication skills on the days that are feeling hard um, so that we can um, kind of look at how to strengthen that area? Friend relationships may be something that's really important to you. So I really want to be able to spend some quality time with my friends. And um, how do I schedule that? Again, making sure that I have enough um, ability to do that um, with all of the other stressors that are happening. Maybe you're someone who really values community, so you want to be actively engaged in volunteer work. So how do you look at um, actively kind of engaging in a volunteer organization that would help you feel validated and re refreshed? Um, spirituality, maybe you're someone who really views um, church as an um, um, activity that's really valuable. And so how do you, again, preserve time and um, energy to be able to participate in that activity? And then hobbies and um, recreation. So being able to um, look at, you know, gosh, I really want to be able to go hiking or it's really important to me to do stand up paddle boarding. And so how do I um, make sure that I have the energy or the adaptive kind of tools that I need to be able to continue to um, participate in that task? 
And then educational and personal growth. If you're someone who, you know, continues to love learning, you know, how do you enroll in some virtual classes or are there, you know, after um, work activities that you could go to where you could be able to learn a new tool or a new skill that you would, um, would help you feel like you're growing in that area. And then employment and career, kind of focusing on what are your values in that area? Is um, your career very important to you? And if so, um, how can you continue to grow in that area? Or are there modifications that you need to make so that you can continue to feel successful? Um, so I think I'm like, I have five minutes left. Um, I can't see if there's questions. So um, should I stop sharing? Would that be helpful? Yep, thank you so much, Krista, for this presentation. Uh, Dr. Levy, our excellent moderator, is coming up as we speak. Okay. There you are. Okay, great, um, thank you. With five minutes, I think we can probably take a couple of questions, maybe from the audience and online, if there are any. Questions for, for Dr. Hugh Toffley? Two right here. So, the biggest thing for me are those unwelcome responses um, or unwelcome opinions and recommendations of the things that you should do, the vitamins you should take. So yeah. what is a good response to that that's still nice? <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, I think that's a great question. We probably all have that first response that pops into our mind um, that isn't so nice. But my um, kind of recommendation would be to just kind of gloss over it and to be like, well, thank you for that opinion. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll consult with my medical team. And then it kind of shuts it down. Um, but I think it is tricky. We have a couple questions on this side. Um, thanks for sharing, first off. Uh, secondly, as far as trying to identify those values and where to put those quote-unquote spoons throughout your day, do you have any techniques or like worksheets that you've found that best help you really identify it? Like if you have two that are like kind of batting heads, how do you really find the best balance between everything? I think that's a great question. Um, I think there's times in your life where one may feel more important than another. And it could be that that varies significantly. Um, there are some worksheets. Um, so behavioral activation is an evidence-based um, therapy for individuals who have depression or just mood-related concerns um, or just are dealing with a lot of stressful situations. Um, and so it can be something that um, a psychologist or mental health provider would have um, accessible. And there are some worksheets available online as well. And I can work with this team to see if I might be able to share that with the individuals who've been attending this conference. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Tuffley. That is very helpful. Um, we'll go on to our, uh, we'll go back to Dr. Harder.